It's a fractured um, social evening today. There are five, there are three openings and two lectures that I know of. I don't know how many more there are. But it's one of those, uh, one of those things that happen and there's nothing we can do about it. Good evening, everybody. On behalf of Gyan Prava and Literature Live, it's my privilege to welcome you all to today's talk by the well-known Palestinian conservation architect and writer Suad Amiri, who is going to share with us her two worlds, the architectural world of her organization, Rewak, which she says is job creation through conservation, and her private and very personal world of her writings. She calls the lecture today, Nothing Makes Sense, Why Should I? Using black and white humor, Amiri brings to life the absurdity of everyday life in occupied Palestine. Humor is what unites human beings, and it seems to be the best way of sharing the ongoing human tragedy in Palestine. You can't explain a tragedy with tragedy, she says, and yet more drama. I'm basically a hakawati, am I pronouncing it right? A storyteller, Suad says with a smile. What unites my architectural world and my writings are the stories behind them. Life is long, a long or short story, a story within a story within a story. If we stop and reflect on it, if we manage to break away from it and fail to grasp it, then you can tell it with a twist, preferably a funny twist. When asked if I write fiction or non-fiction, I say both, for everyday life in Palestine is the biggest fiction. Reality or non-fictional life in occupied Palestine is the biggest fiction and hunting fantasy. Amiri's talk coincides with the launching of her new book, Golda Slept Here, published by Women Unlimited in India. Suad was born in Damascus from a Syrian mother and a Palestinian father. She lived most of her life between Amman, Damascus, Beirut, and Cairo. She now lives with her husband, Salim Tamari, in Ramallah, Palestine. She's the founder of the Palestinian NGO Rewak, a winner of the 2013 Aga Khan Award for Architecture. Rewak documents, conserves, and rehabilitates historic buildings and centers in rural Palestine. Her other books, which have, uh, that the world famous book is Sharon and My Mother-in-Law, which was translated into 20 languages and has won her the prestigious Italian Literary Award, Premio Viareggio. Her other books include Nothing to Lose But Your Life, An 18-Hour Journey with Murad, and Menopausal Palestine, Women on the Edge. Amiri has also contributed to the collection of essays. The book is called Seeking Palestine. Both have been published in India by Women Unlimited. After Suad's presentation on her, on her life and her work, we will have her in conversation with Anil Dharkar, who is, uh, as we all know, has just successfully completed uh, third, fourth edition, fourth, right? Fourth edition of Mumbai Lit Fest, uh, which I must say was just extraordinary. I was able to attend it only on one of the three days and uh, enjoyed it immensely. And um, so now I'm going to, going to invite Suad to address us. So please give her a hearty welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for being here in this lovely town with so many activities. If I was given the choice, actually, I would stay outside, but I had to, to come here. Um, it's always, this is my second trip in India, so I am really, really happy, and I thank Ritu, my publisher, for bringing me with every book. So I have an incentive to keep writing, I must say. And Darashmi, thank you very much for inviting me. This is my first time in this lovely city. I have been here for a few hours, but 
I told Ritu, would you be upset with me if I told you that I have a feeling for Bombay more than New Delhi and Calcutta where she took me last year? <laughs> and she said, no, it's okay, Saad. We all love the city. So really, I am very delighted. Uh, Rashmi had asked me, normally I either do architectural presentation or I do a writer's presentation. This is the first time I venture into putting them together. And if it doesn't make sense, you would understand why. But I want to share with you something. Actually, I have lived all my life, professional life, as an architect. I studied architecture at the Amer I'm, I'm not bragging, I'm just trying to make a point. I studied architecture at the American University of Beirut, then went and did my masters, then went and did my PhD, I wrote thesis, I taught at the university, and I worked hard, really, 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 until the year of 2002. And then my mother-in-law comes during the Israeli occupation. My mother-in-law was 91 years old. Thanks God she was living on her own. But because of the curfew, the Israelis put us under curfew for 42 days. And those of you who don't know what curfew is, you cannot come out of your house for 42 days. Every three days, they would uplift the curfew, so we'd all go out like mad for three hours trying to buy things. At that time, my husband was away, and my mother-in-law was living in her house, and her house was very happen happened to be very close to the Arafat. Headquarter. And those of you who remember, Sharon had bombarded Arafat's headquarter for 40 days. And my mother-in-law was living on her own at that time. It took 12 days for me to be able to come from our, my house, go to her house, and bring her. Remember, she's a 91-year-old woman living on her own without electricity, without light, without telephones because the Israelis have shut all of those on the city of Ramallah. And I managed to bring my mother-in-law to live with me. And I always tell the Israelis, maybe one day I may forgive you what you have done for the Palestinians. But one thing I shall never forgive you for, having my mother-in-law live with me for 42 days. <laughs> she drove me crazy. She literally drove me crazy. She's a very stubborn mother-in-law, like all mother-in-laws, and I happen to be also stubborn. So we had this conflict of life. She's very organized, and I am very disorganized. And under curfew, she wanted to have a normal life. She wanted to have breakfast at 7 o'clock in the morning, and lunch at one and dinner at seven, when I didn't know which day of the week it was and which hour I would sleep late. And what I did actually, I always say, I ended up with two occupations, one outside the house and one, si one inside the house. And don't ask me which one is more difficult to manage. But that visit actually made a writer out of me. What happened every night before, thanks God, my mother-in-law went to bed at seven o'clock. So that gave me plenty of time to sit on my computer and write whatever happened that evening inside the house. And every three days, whenever the Israelis uplifted the curfew, I would write what happened to the Israeli and the Palestinians when they lifted the curfew. And these were very personal notes. And I sent them to my niece, and I sent them to an Italian friend of mine by the name of Luisa Morgantini, and they were basically complaining about my mother-in-law. <laughs> and I would say, please don't share it with anybody. And let alone, Luisa Morgantini happened to be the, pri the, the vice president of the European Parliament, so I received one day an email from her saying, Suhad, would you mind if I shared them with all parliamentarian members? <laughs> I said, you must be out of your mind. What do the parliamentarian care about my mother making marmalade <laughs> and not having sugar at home and about my dog? Little I realized that really those are the things. I always say I studied architecture for 15 years. Nobody heard about me. And my mother-in-law came to visit me for 40 days, and here I am in Bombay because of that. 
That's my world of architecture and writing. To, now I want to put the architectural hat. And Hakawati, by the way, means a storyteller. A storyteller, when you give them the microphone, they never, you're not going to get it tonight. I shall tell you that. <laughs> so I want to share with you my architectural life. I'm going to do a presentation, maximum 15 to 20 minutes. And in it, I will share a little bit of writing. But the writing, we should do it in more in a dialogue form. So I'm sure many of you have not been to Palestine. So what I want to do, the first five or four minutes, to take you on a trip to Palestine. So just relax and enjoy. Palestinian village looks like. This is one of the villages that we are conserving. This is Jerusalem, Hebron, Jerusalem. I'll show you some slides of urban and rural architecture. Houses from Ramallah and Jerusalem, a monastery in Bethlehem, a house in Nablus, a house in Jerusalem. A village next to Ramallah. This is something that Ruach rehabilitated. A palace in a village. A community center. This is what a peasant house looks from the inside. These are mud bins where the peasants put their products interior of a modern peasant house, interior of a house, a peasant house, a detail of a door. We're done with the fun. Now, I want to share with you who I am and how I think I became an architect. You know, we never know what makes us an architect or a writer. But I must tell you that I thought of becoming everything in life. My father used to say you should become a lawyer because you speak so much. And my mother said you should get on stage because you speak so much. <laughs> and I wanted to study, I love nature and animals, so I wanted to study either environment or agriculture. But somehow, I think, because of my dyslexia, I discovered later in life that I was dyslexic, that's why I think I became an architect. But I like to theorize about how I become an architect, but in reality, it is the dyslexia. And here I am, a writer with dyslexia, but we'll discuss that later. Actually, as, <laughs> as Rashmi said, I am a half Syrian, half Palestinian, and this is my family. And here I am, the little girl with daddy's favorite baby. And this is, I grew up between two cities. One was very present, this is Damascus. My mother came from Damascus, from a beautiful house, which is the Jabri house. 
And I grew up with the absence of a city, which is Jaffa. That's where my father came from. And I grew up as a refugee in Amman. So I always had to remember because how my father's house looked like. Because with the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, my family was kicked out. So my father always talked about Jaffa, about his house. And here I was from a distance trying to see how this town looked like and how our house looked like. This is my mother's house in Damascus, and my father's house was an, an absent house in my, in, in, in my mind. So I always say I was trying to make models of how did my father's house look like and how did my father's city look like. And of course, when you grow in Damascus, those of you who have been in Damascus, it's a city that leaves its mark on it. This is the neighborhood which I grew up. So the alleys of Damascus always left, left an impact on my mind. And when I decided how come I never opened an architectural office, and I decided it's much more important to protect a historic building rather than leave my mark as Saad Amiri in, in, on a new building, I really decided it would be much more important for humanity that I don't build and I save. And I want to take you in a trip. This is Riwaq, is the name of the organization that I started in 91. I came to Palestine in 81. And 10 years later, I decided Palestine had enough cultural heritage that needed to be protected. So I took Rewalk, my organization, on a 22-year trip. And I always call it from the light bulb to the Aga Khan Award. The bulb was the first meeting we ever had in Rewalk. I rented this place. I paid its rents. There was nobody to come to this place. I don't know how many of you have started organizations. But you have a building and nothing happens on it. And the first meeting happened in the evening like now, and I realized we don't have a bulb. So I ran out and bought the bulb for that organization. So I am always proud to say that I have taken you from a place that had no bulb to the Aga Khan Foundation, which happened just at the Aga Khan Award. Now, in our work, I don't know how many of you are architects, I'm not going to be too technical, but I can say that our work was in the work divided into three phases. The phase one was we needed to know what is it we have in Palestine. So we started a documentation phase in which we started documenting everything that existed in Palestine, whether they are the traditional tiles, and we revived those tiles, as you can see here, or doing training courses for young men and women in the traditional crafts. This is one of the traditions in Palestine. We did something called the National Register of Historic Building. It would be silly to start an organization not knowing what is it that you have. So we had a 10-year or 13-year project in which we documented 50,000 50,320 buildings, and uh, by then we have realized how much we have, how many buildings. And then I must tell you something. As architects, conservation architects, we always think that if we go and meet with the villagers, with the people, and tell them this building is aesthetically so pleasing, this belongs to the Roman or Byzantine or uh, Mamluk or name it, which period, they're not interested, really, they're not interested. We had to find a new way of thinking about rehabilitation and conservation. And we figured out the only time that peasants and people become really simple people, become interested in the idea of conservation, is when they can benefit from it, benefit. Benefit meaning putting a bucket in their pocket or benefit meaning that they're gonna use that space. So I think the success of our organization was from the fact that we connected conservation with job creation and with culture. What we have done is the first, the second phase, something called conservation, job creation through conservation. We would go to villages, meet with the villagers, with the village council, and say, what is that this, com what do you need in this community? A public use. And most of them would come and say, we would need a women's center, children's centers, an art center. And eventually, we worked with an existing NGO. We did not have to create an NGO because that doesn't work. We found which NGO is active in this 
And we found a person who has an interesting old building that is dilapidated. And we tell the owner, would you give us the use of your building for 10 to 12 years? We will put the money to renovate that building for you. And we will tell the NGO, you're going to use this building for free, the NGO that already exists. It could be women, it could be children, it could be whatever, education. And they would use that building for 12 years. So the owner is happy because the building, his house has been renovated. The NGO is extremely happy because they have a free, beautiful building. They move from an ugly concrete building into a beautiful renovated building. But most important, the community is happy because we have created job for that locality. The contractors are not allowed to bring workers from one city to another because it's cheaper. They have to hire every single worker from this community, this village. And we're talking about small villages of three to 4,000 people. I think in India it could be a family. <laughs> now, the work really, to be successful as architects, we stop thinking of buildings. You have to think of workers and people. When, com when architects start thinking of workers and people, then we succeed. And what we did, we did training courses for workers, those workers who did not know how to do. And here I'm going to show you some of the buildings before, how we would, they would allocate the building, and this is how it became after we renovated it. This is how they, in one of the villages, there is this palace, and the owner gave the use for a, for a women's center, and this is how it became.